First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 is where we're at in our text of Scripture uh, this morning as we continue our series on pillars. You know, it's very unique to be a human because we ask different questions. Now, I want to press in on you a little bit this morning. Let me just ask you a question here today. Why do you exist? You're like, whoa, we're, we're going in strong here, coming in hot today, right? Why do you exist? What are you here for? What is the purpose of life? Where's this going, Pastor Mike? Those are heavy questions. And you know, it's unique to be human because humans ask questions like that. At some point in time, most people ask a question like that. Who am I? Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? We ponder those questions. We ponder eternity. We ponder the afterlife. Is this all that there is or is there more after I die? It's uniquely human. Other creatures don't do this. How many of you have a pet at home? Anybody have a pet? Okay. Keep your hand up if it's a dog. All right. Switch it up if it's a cat. All right. Two hands up if it's both. All right. Look at the crazies out there. That's right. There we go. We don't have a pet. Uh, my daughter and son were pretty excited yesterday. They uh, capture some roly polies in the yard, put them in cups. And one of them is like, finally, I have a pet. Sorry, sweetie, it's only going to last 24 hours, all right? <laughs> Especially in a cup like that. We don't have pets at our house. But even the smartest pet, even the smartest dog or the smartest cat never wakes up in a morning and says, huh, I wonder why I'm here, right? Doesn't happen. Squirrels, worms, uh, even monkeys are pretty smart, but there's no monkey that ever woke up and said, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Give me a banana. That sounds good to me. Or a dog. What am I supposed to Squirrel, rabbit. There we go. That's my purpose for life. Eating, sleeping, chasing things. There we go. But as humans, it's different. Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? As Christians, we have answers to those questions. The world actually has answers as well, and they try to answer those questions, but they answer those questions completely wrong. They answer those questions in a radically individualistic sort of way. The world will answer that question like this, that ultimate meaning is found in self-defining your identity. That's how the world likes to answer questions like this. Do you find ultimate meaning in trying to be who you are and finding out who you are and all notions of design are completely pushed aside in the world's way of thinking? And friends, I want you to know this morning that concept is wrong because God has designed you. God has made you who you are and God defines who you are, why you're here, and what it is you're supposed to be doing. And obviously someone's not happy about that. <laughs> I love it. I love having kids in here, by the way. Everybody's like, I'm so sorry. You know what? I really didn't even notice it, except that side. But most of the time, didn't even notice it, right? Why am I here? God tells you why you're here. Now, let me just tweak this a little bit because sometimes I think we get the wrong idea in our minds and the world's notion of this radical individualism kind of creeps into the Christian world as well and we try to think of what we're supposed to be doing in terms of a very unique and special calling by Jesus. And, and you see that today, seminars and books and conferences. Come and find your unique, what does Jesus want you to do? What special thing does Jesus... You know what? It's not that individualized. That, that's how a lot of Christians function, though. You've got the Christians that are the well diggers. You've got the Christians that are the social justice crusaders. You've got the Christians that are out there to solve poverty, and they find this my special calling as a Christian. This is what Jesus has called me to do. It's not that individualized. It's like the family I talked to years ago. They had little kids. They were trying to search for a local church. They said, you know what? You wouldn't believe it. And they're just sitting at home every week. They're not even going to church. They're sitting at home. You won't even believe it that we've been searching for a church for two years and Jesus hasn't shown us the right church to attend yet. I thought, in my mind, I didn't say it. I know you're surprised. Sometimes I have thoughts that don't come out of my mouth. It's surprising, isn't it? I thought, I didn't say it. I thought, you've totally missed the boat. You've made this all about you. You should have planted yourself in a church about eh, 21, 22, 23 months ago. It's not that 
unique and specific. You know what God wants for your life? He wants you to plug into a local church and serve and be fed the Word of God. We make it too special, too unique, and really it's much simpler than that. We are on mission by the Lord Jesus Christ. We are on mission collectively as a church. Today we're going to talk about that mission. What is God's mission for us? We love God's mission as a local church. And it's not for each of you to find God's very unique, special calling on your life. It's to join in the mission that He's given us collectively as His church in the world today. The mission of a church, why do we have a mission of the church? Well, a mission of a local church describes why we exist. And our mission here at this local church is making more and better. Woo! Good stuff. Making more and better disciples. Very generic mission. It's very unoriginal. It comes from Matthew chapter 28. So what does that look like for our church? And that's where we make it unique. That's where we describe the unique DNA of Soteria Church and what we're about. If you were to say, what's the heartbeat of our church? And that's our pillars. That's the name of the series. We're going through our four pillars. You can call them our core values, a substance of who we are. It describes who we are inside of that mission. And then we play that out with our strategy, which talks about how the rhythms of ministry and how we engage with the mission and the pillars. And we talk about it in terms of learn in church, grow in groups, serve the body of Christ, learn, grow, and serve is the rhythms of ministry, the strategy for playing out that mission. So the pillars of our church to review, again, we're a church that loves God's word. We're a church that loves God's people. By the way, if you're just jumping in today, you can go back and listen to all these. It'd be beneficial to you to see just kind of who we are as a local church. We are a church that loves God's presence, and we are a church, by His grace, that loves God's mission. These are what we are and what we're hoping to be. We want to be described by this, and we want to help our church family grow in these loves collectively together. And so this morning, pillar number four, we are a church that loves God's mission. One of the glorious things about being a Christian is that God tells us who we are, why we're here, and what it is that we're supposed to be doing. God tells us. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to worry about it. He tells us clearly what we're supposed to be doing. And so for each of these sermons, I ask two questions, the why and the how. So why do we love, in this case, God's mission, and how do we love God's mission? And so let's dive into that here this morning. Why do we love God's mission? And you could fill in a lot of answers to that, but looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, I see it like this. We love God's mission because we are a people who have been rescued by God's mission. We've experienced the joy of God's grace and the rescue of God's mercy in our lives, and because we've enjoyed that, embraced that, we love it. This is God's mission. Man, I was one of those people that was rescued, and now I'm this, and I used to be that. And because of it, I love, I love His mission, and I want to be part of His mission. So let's walk through the flow of the text here this morning. I've just laid it out in some sentences, but I want you to see it's rooted here in the Scriptures, verses 9 to 10 of 1 Peter chapter 2. If you'll look at your Bibles with me and follow along as I read, it gives us some words and some descriptors on who we are. It says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now, all of these descriptors are coming from the Old Testament. We could easily spend a sermon on each one of these. These are the words that God gave to Israel, Exodus chapter 19. If you go back and read Exodus chapter 19, he called Israel and he says, you are a chosen race, my special possession, a royal priesthood, and he gathers them together and he says, this is your purpose for living, now go after it. Exodus chapter 19, it's a very crude summary of that chapter. It goes on, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Those of you who were once not a people of God, but now you are a people of God. Those of you who once had not received mercy, but now you receive mercy. And you see, most of the language here in these verses is descriptive of who we are. So I want you to see as we walk through the text this morning, number one, knowing who we are 
and where we came from leads to something, but let's just camp there for a second. Knowing who we are and where we came from. Friends, that does something to you. When you really understand who you are, when you really understand where you came from, when you really understand what God saved you from, that changes you. That impacts you. That really modifies your thinking and changes the paradigm of life. So who are we and where did we come from? Well, let's just walk through the text phrase by phrase. He says, number one, we are a chosen race. Verse 9, you are a chosen race. This goes back to the language that God used with Israel. And by the way, if you're wondering, this does not mean that we have replaced Israel. These are descriptors on the people of God. And there have been different peoples of God through the years, and all the peoples of God have really had the same function in the world. And so Israel had this function, and we have this function as well. Abraham had the same function of being a royal priesthood and a holy nation, etc., etc. So it's not saying we replaced Israel in any way. But now we are doing the same function that Israel had back when God called them. He says, you are a chosen race. What does this mean for Israel? What does this mean for us? Well, for Israel, it meant that God actually generated them as a people. God invented them. God made them up as a people group. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 7, he says, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest of nations. I didn't choose you because you were so big as a nation, so great as a nation. Well, that's very true. Because when God chose them, the nation was two people, Abraham and Sarah. So obviously, God didn't choose them because they were so big or so great because they were a nation of two people. God just said, I'm going to create a new nation. I'm going to create a new ethnicity. How do you create a new ethnicity? Well, if anybody wants to take notes, if you're trying to create a new ethnicity, here's your process, all right? Have your kids marry their cousins. And have their kids marry their cousins and their kids marry their cousins. Just have them keep marrying their cousins and pretty soon you'll have a new ethnicity. Please don't do what I just told you to do. It's illegal in the state of Iowa. But that's what God did. Abraham, send Isaac back to your father's house. Have him marry his cousin. Isaac, have your son Jacob go marry his cousins. Jacob, you got 12 sons. They started to marry outside the family. God said, no, 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 no. Let's marry the cousins. Shove them over to Egypt. Don't give them any other options. Nobody else to date. The Egyptians didn't want to date shepherds. They were stuck with just dating their cousins. 400 years in Egypt, they came out 2 million people strong. Finally, they weren't dating their cousins anymore. Right? That 2 million people, but it all sourced back to the same tree. Right? God created this nation. God created this ethnicity. He invented it. He made it up. What does it say about us? You are a chosen race, like Israel. God's made a new ethnicity. It's not black, white, Latino, Shades of brown, it's not, it's not that. It's not that kind of an ethnicity. Although we do share blood, we share the blood of Christ. We're brought together. We're bought by His blood. We're given new hearts by the Holy Spirit. And suddenly we're made into a new race, a new ethnicity, the people of God, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. As Christ is our head, we've now have a chosen and special status with God. God actually prefers us over all peoples in the world, in a sense. We are his chosen people, interestingly. We go on and learn more from these words. Number two, we are a royal priesthood. Now, what a great phrase, a royal priesthood. When God created Israel, he put them together to be a royal priesthood. They were priests inside of the nation they had priests but they were also to be priests a, a priesthood for the rest of the world you know what did what was the function of this the function was to be a mediatorial role to the rest of the world to mediate between god and humans now inside of israel they had priests that mediated and you'd come to the priests and they'd mediate the relationship between you and God, but as a nation, a royal priesthood, a nation that was a priesthood, they were to be a connection to God to the nations around them. God says to us, you are a royal priesthood. You are 
to mediate the presence of God with each other and also with the nations around as well. We deal with mediators all the time in our lives. This last week, I work with an organization here in town called the Family Leader, their church ambassador network, which tries to connect pastors to legislators and people in the government. We had a meeting, three, three of us pastors, we met with the lieutenant governor of Iowa. And we've done that several times. We sit, we talk to him, we pray for him, we ask you know, how, how we can support him. It's just a really cool experience. But when we started, we came to his office and there was this guy that walked out and he says, I'm sorry, the lieutenant governor is still on a phone call. We'll be right with you. All right, sounds good. So we're standing outside the office. A few minutes later, he comes back. He says, he's ready to see you now. So we follow him back to the office. We sit down, we have this meeting. It was good, about a half hour long. A little while later, that same guy comes back in. Hey, we need to wrap this up here, okay? <laughs> he, he was mediating the, the, the meeting and the guy from the family leader says, whenever you call the executive branch of the state of Iowa, it's, it's always like that. You get a date. They don't say, hey, which date works for you? No, this is your date. You come here or you don't come. Mediating the presence. You go through a mediator sometimes when you call customer service and you get the automated system. Don't you love the automated system? Press one for this. I try to work through it, but we all know how we can shortcut the mediator. You just push zero. I don't want to deal with a mediator. Let's get right to it. Mediators. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, to connect people to God. And I think what's fascinating here in this text, and this is really the only place in the New Testament that teaches this for us as the church to be a royal priesthood, is this is not supposed to be an individualistic thing. Sometimes we get too wrapped up. I am a priest before the Lord. Jesus made me. There is a sense in which that's true, but if you go back in verse 5, it says you as living stones. So there's the individual piece. You are living stones, but it immediately goes to corporate. Okay, As living stones, you're being built together to be a holy priesthood. And so collectively we serve as this priesthood. Collectively we intercede for each other inside of our groups and pray for each other. It's a collective priesthood. The idea is corporate, not individual. Somebody said it like this, you are not chosen, pitied, possessed, and holy, just to fritter away your time doing nothing. You are called to minister the presence of God to others. It's exactly what we're supposed to be doing because God's called us as a chosen race, a holy priesthood. Number three, he also calls us a holy nation. What does this mean to be a holy nation? Well, this gets to the idea of character that we are called to something. And too many times I think we're trying to find this special calling that Jesus has for me to go do something. And really, the biggest thing that God has called you to as a Christian in the church today, the biggest calling on your life is holiness, Christ-likeness. That's why he's called us to be his people, to be holy, to be a holy nation as it says here in the text. Somebody said it like this, there's nothing God needs us to do so badly that it warrants neglecting some aspect of Christ's likeness in our lives. We can be about all kinds of good things. We can be about the mission or, or trying to do things for Jesus. But listen, your number one priority as a Christian is to bear fruit for Jesus. It's Christ's likeness. Jesus called us together to grow in Christ-likeness, to grow in holiness together. Well, the text goes on here as you go to the end of verse 9 and verse 10. We also learn that we are a special possession of His. He owns us. I like that phrase. God says, listen, I own you. Now, this is not like slavery. This is a, we are His special possession it's a special possession. We are sons and daughters of Almighty God, His special possession. We also learn here at the end of these verses that we are pitied by God as well. Look how it says it here in your Bibles at the end of verse 9. Of the one who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy out of darkness into light. Not a people, now a people. Not receive mercy, now receive mercy. 
Why? Because God pitied us. Because God looked down in our saddest state and decided to save us. That God saw us while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies of His. And decided to save us. Decided to make us a chosen race. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special possession. To call us out of darkness into His glorious light. Man, what a a glorious text of Scripture. Knowing who you are and where you came from, my goodness, that changes everything. There are very few moments in life that you could truly say are life-changing or paradigm-changing. I had one such moment back in January of 2019. My wife and I were in the Philippines. I was preaching at a Christian school. We got to go visit a place there called Tondo, which is a trash dump in the Philippines, and there's people that live there in apartment building. They're not really, I'd say, apartment buildings. They're like these bunkers that the government built. There's 10,000 people that live in these bunkers, and some of just one room, people, whole families are living in single rooms. I mean, it, it's, it's everything you can imagine of a group of people that live in a trash dump. Garbage everywhere. We walked through one of those buildings where people live. There's no floors, it's just dirt. You have to step over things, step over stuff, you know, things and stuff all over. There's a distinctive smell. I can still smell, and sometimes if I think hard, I can still smell what that was like in that place. The kids aren't taken care of very well. Some kids don't even have parents anymore. They just kind of live there. Most of the kids are malnourished. They make their living from sorting through the trash and pulling out things they can resell. They have places to eat, like little stands. You might call it a a restaurant, quote-unquote, where they dig through the trash and they find food that was discarded and they recook it and sell it. That's, That's their meals. We were standing in one of those buildings where there's a ministry. They're trying to reach people there and care for the kids, feed the kids. And there was this little girl that came up to me. And she was wanting me to see something. She was so proud of her dress. It was an Elsa dress. Elsa's from Frozen, by the way, in case you don't know who Elsa is. It was torn. It was dirty. None of us would let our kids wear that. Someone had obviously thrown it away and she'd rescued it from the garbage. She was so proud to have that Elsa dress. She took my hand and wanted to show me some of the other treasures that she had. And as I experienced that, just tears filled my eyes because she's right about the same age as my daughter. And I thought, except for the grace of God, That could be my kids. And I wanted my kids to know that. And when I got home from that trip, I just wanted to grab my kids and and squeeze them and tell them I love them in a different way. That I treasure them. That was a powerful experience. And I want you to know this morning, I want you to understand here today that Jesus has rescued you from the trash heap. Jesus has cleaned you up. Jesus has given you clean clothes. Jesus has fed you healthy food. Jesus has bandaged your wounds. How much of a treasure is Jesus to you? It's where this text leads us to see who we were and who we are today. There ought to be a reaction to that because knowing who you are and where you came from should cause you to treasure Jesus. To realize what you've been saved from. To understand how he rescued you off of the trash heap and made you one of his children. It's amazing. Incredible. 
One of the things that you learn as you go through life is that there's a special connection between parents and kids. You, you have a connection with the people that you call mom and dad, whether they're blood related to you or not, the people that raised you. <clears throat> there's a connection. And as a parent, there's a connection with the kids that God's put in your, in your life, in your home, and you love them. And it doesn't matter, in a sense, how wicked a parent can be to a child or a child can be to a parent. There's still a bond. There's still love because there's, there's connection there. But the more that you get to know Jesus, the more you realize that He is good and only good all the time. He is good. There's never any tension. There's never any wickedness or evil that flows from father to son. He is good. That's what it says. First Peter chapter 2, verse 3, if you have tasted that the Lord is good and the more that you taste of Jesus, the more you realize that He is good, that He is a treasure, that look at what He's done, look at how He saved me. He's a treasure. So knowing who you are and where you came from ought to cause you to treasure Christ. And then there's another move that the text makes, and I want you to see number three here. Knowing who we are, where we came from, causes us to treasure Christ and to proclaim Him with our lives. That's the motivation for our mission. I could stand here today and do the classic guilt trip. After all that Jesus has done for you, you can't even go and witness to your neighbors. We don't need that. We don't need that. What we need is to know who we are. How Jesus saved us. How good He is. What a treasure He is to us. And because of the treasure that He is to us, that we proclaim Him with our lives, that we are people who have found the excellencies of Christ and it just emanates from who we are. He is a treasure to us personally, collectively. John Piper said it like this, so our power to witness to unbelievers, this is a phenomenal quote, our power to witness to unbelievers will grow in direct proportion to how precious Jesus really is to you. The depth to which we know him formulates the power of our witness. Our testimony out there grows in proportion to how great of a treasure Jesus is to us. And so when I say we need to be a church that loves God's mission, that starts with treasuring Jesus above all else. To know that he is good. To come to him like a living stone, tasting that he is good, drinking the milk of his word. Knowing him. Knowing that he is good. And letting that emanate out from our lives. Letting the excellencies of who He is show to the world around us. And you say, where are you getting this from? Well, it's so interesting how the text is constructed. I just sat and pondered it this week as I studied this text. I want you to look at these two verses, verses 9 and 10 again in your Bibles. Everything that we see here in these verses talks about who we are and what Jesus saved us from. You are this. You are this. You are this. You used to be this, but now you're this. You used to be that, but now you are something different. That, that's these two verses. That's all it is, except for right in the middle of verse 9. Look right in the middle of verse 9. Here's why Jesus did all of this for us. It says, so that you may proclaim the praises or excellencies, however you translate that, of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people of God, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. There's the purpose statement. So that you may proclaim to the world around you that Jesus is your treasure. Listen, people will know what your treasures are. People will know what you treasure my neighbors are acutely aware of a treasure because they see me 
pull it out, an ugly off-white 84 Firebird, pull it out of my garage and drive it down and come back into my garage, pull it in and stick a cover over it. It's a treasure. The reason there's a cover over it is because there's little kids in my house that come in with their bikes and stuff and they dare not scratch it. Right? They know that. The neighbors can see that it's a tre- people know what your treasures are. They can see what your treasures are. And when they see that your treasure is Jesus, it's powerful. It's a powerful testimony to those around us. Why do we love God's mission? Because we're people that have been rescued by God's mission. How do we love God's mission? By boldly and passionately proclaiming the excellencies of Jesus to a lost and dying world. What does that look like? I've just thought of a number of ways that we can do that. And again, all of this context of 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2 is a collective, corporate context. It's not individualistic. It's corporate. It's collective. We do this together. God saved us to be together as a church. Our witness is together even. Now, we have individual witness in that, but really the heart of the witness is a collective witness to the world around us. And so how is it How is it that we make the excellencies of Jesus known to those around us? Number one, gathering together. Gathering. That's that's simple, right? But listen, you show that Jesus is a treasure to you when you set aside time every Sunday to come and sit in these pews. That's a statement. It's a statement to us together as you look around. I want you to go ahead, just look around. Look around, go ahead. go ahead. Gawk around, gawk around. You love to gawk in. I know we all love to gawk. Look around it, everybody, okay? By your presence here, you're saying Jesus is a treasure. As you leave your house on Sunday mornings, you're saying to your neighbors, Jesus is a treasure. Now, it might be a little bit different for me. I'm a pastor, so my, par- or my parents, my neighbors see me leaving the house all the time. Where are you going? Going to church? You know, that's normal. Yesterday, crazy. I was in my work clothes. I was doing some painting, and my next-door neighbors, they walk out. He's got a suit on. She has a dress on. I'm like, what in the world? I'm in work clothes. You're in a suit. And we just kind of had a fun exchange about it, because they were actually going to a church on that Sunday to mass for a wedding. It was a fun exchange. But listen, your, your neighbors see you leave on a Sunday. There's a testimony to that. Jesus is a treasure, therefore I want to be together with his people, with his body. It takes a certain amount of humility to come and sit in these pews. It takes humility to sit in the pews here in a church service, to humble yourself underneath God's word and to have God's word preached to you. Some people would say, you know, I just, I'd rather be serving when I come to church. I, I don't really like to sit, and I like to be serving. No, there's a pride issue there because it takes humility to sit under God's word word, and it shows that Jesus is a treasure to you. Gathering together, growing together, making time in your life for growth groups to come around God's word with his body and smaller groups of people to love each other and to love God's word together. Three, serving together. We want people to serve. We grow in our rhythms of learning, growing, and serving to be active in the ministry And that's going to be a next step for you here this morning. You can even start thinking about it right now. How is it that you would like to serve? We have lots of new people here at our church right now. God's been blessing us in tremendous ways. How is it that you can engage in serving here with us as a local church? Maybe just write on your Connect card at the end today, I need to get connected into serving. You can just write that down. We'll help you get connected. Or if you have a certain area in mind. But we show that Jesus is a treasure and proclaim His excellencies when we serve together in the body of Christ. Number four, giving together. We show that Jesus is a treasure when we give. Now, by God's grace, we are doing great financially. And maybe when you hear that, you think, that's awesome. That means I don't have to give. No, that's not what it means. Because you don't give because the church needs it. You give because you need it. You give because you need to build that principle of generosity in your life. You give because you show that Jesus is a treasure by giving a certain percentage of your income to support his mission around the world. If you're not engaged in giving yet, I'd ask you to participate with us, to partner with us in giving. You can grab one of the cards in the pew rack there in front of you. It says giving. Look that over. There's different ways to give. There's the offering boxes in the back every Sunday. 
You can give online. If you're not giving, consider partnering with us in giving. Not because we need it, but because you need it. And you need that discipline in your life. And you need to show that Jesus is a treasure through your finances. Also, sharing together is powerful. Now, I say sharing together, I'm talking about telling other people about Jesus. But there's a together aspect that's very powerful to that. When I meet unbelievers and I talk to unbelievers, one of my major goals in talking to unbelievers is at some point bridging in other believers into that conversation. Have unbelievers to your house, but also bring other believers with you. That's powerful. There's a together aspect that's powerful with it. I'd encourage you with your growth groups. How can you do things as growth groups? Activities where you intentionally incorporate unbelievers to be around a group of people who treasure Jesus together. There's power in that. When unbelievers can see what it looks like to treasure Jesus together. And finally, multiplying together. If we love Jesus, we treasure Jesus. We want more people to know Jesus and to treasure Jesus, which is why we multiply from the lowest levels to the highest levels, the individual to the macro church level, to always be thinking, even inside growth groups, who is it we could tag and identify as a future leader to go lead other people to know Jesus more? It's why we planted Park Church on the east side so the more people can treasure Jesus. That's why, Lord willing, by His grace, we want to plant more churches so that we can decrease the lostness of the city of Des Moines because more people in this city need to treasure Jesus. We want to be a church that loves God's mission, loves God's mission. What is God calling you to do? Well, don't sit around and try to figure out some special, unique calling that Jesus has on your life because it's really quite simple. Make more and better disciples. Plug in at your local church. Serve together with other believers. What's God looking for? He's looking for ordinary Christians that come to church, they gather with the body of Christ, they serve, they give, they multiply together. That's what God's looking for. Not some special, unique talent. He, he wants you to plug in to be who you are as chosen people who were in darkness but are now in light, who had not received mercy, that now have received mercy. To love his mission. Recently, I listened to a testimony of a person. He used to be a pastor. He left the faith. And I listened to his resignation speech at his church this was before he left the faith, but his resignation speech was filled with lots of me language. I need to resign. I need to leave because I just need to find out what Jesus wants for me. I want to know Jesus' special calling on my life. I just really need to figure out how Jesus is leading me. And I listened to that, and he had not left the faith at that point. He was resigning from his church, but I thought, man, all the seeds of his departure were right there in that speech because it was completely focused on himself. And as we go through 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2, really it's all about this together. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We're together treasuring Christ so that others may also treasure Christ.